Okay. Okay, well, the uh, German physicist uh, Rudolf Clausius gets credit for uh, def uh, of the first iteration of the first law of thermodynamics. He said, in a closed system, the increment in internal energy is equal to the difference between the heat accumulated by the system and the work done by it. In other words, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. We've, of course, heard that. Applied to human systems, we have the familiar uh, e uh, equation, calorie intake minus calorie expenditure equals calorie stored. Or in humans, calories are stored primarily as body fat. So we can instead determine the possible of body fat. According to the conventional interpretation of this law, Obesity is a failure in the voluntary control over energy balance. In other words, we live in a, an environment with an abundance of tasty foods that are easily overconsumed, and we don't have enough, we don't have sufficient opportunity in our environment to burn off those calories. And so that excess in the form of glucose, lipids, energy-rich substances build up in the bloodstream and then get forced into the fat cells, making fat cells anabolic, or in other words, making them grow. So the simple solution is, as we have heard many times, just eat less and move more. The conventional view places specific responsibility for controlling this balance on the So for example, the USDA uh, at their MyPlate website said that reaching a healthy weight is a balance. The secret is to learn how to balance your energy in and energy out. The first food guide pyramid was in fact the ultimate expression of this mindset because that had has twice the calories of other nutrients. Uh, it's easily overconsumed according to the theory. So remember we were supposed to eat all fats and everything. And instead, really load up on the carbohydrate. Remember, six to 11 servings of mostly, most of these are processed grains. Things didn't work out so well. Uh, this slide shows the relationship between calories, and percentage of fat in our diet over time, um, from 42% in the 1960s to approaching the government recommended 30%. Of course, you know, awkwardly, just as we began to focus on reducing fat in our diet, the obesity epidemic really unfolded. It doesn't cause a cause effect, but it suggests that the ongoing focus on reducing fat uh, is probably not going to turn things around. It's not going to suddenly re return obesity prevalence back down to pre obesity levels. And in the longest and largest low-fat low diet fat study fat ever done, and this, this one is the Women's Health Initiative. 50,000 women went on to either a low-fat diet with intensive support, individual and group counseling sessions, other encouragement to eat uh, fruits and vegetables, basically healthy diet, versus a control group that just got written educational material. So this diet, this study was really biased to favor a low-fat diet. You know, they gave them the kitchen sink, and the other group just you know, said, here's some written materials, do your best. For all that, they had a maximum kilogram, less than five pound weight loss, which was probably just the effect of increased tension and, and intensity with rapid weight regain, virtually no, no different body weight throughout the study. When, when meta-analyses are done, systematic reviews that fairly can compare a low-fat low diet to a higher-fat diet, be it a yeah. Mediterranean diet or a low-carbohydrate diet, in which both groups have the same level of support, the same intensity of treatment, quite consistently in these publications, including this one that came out uh, very recently, in which I, uh, for which I was a co-author, 
that the low-fat diets appear to be less effective than every other comparison, suggesting that our, our intensive focus on reducing dietary fat may have actually contributed to the problem in the first place. We know that very few people can lose weight and keep it off according to the conventional approach, which has overwhelmingly been a low-fat, low-calorie diet. Uh, this national survey reported one in six adults keep uh, overweight or adults with overweight or obesity keep off just 10% of their weight for one year. And of course, most people with excessive weight, they carry it their whole life, and it's much more than just 10% over. Among children, the situation is just as discouraging. Uh, this quote from Len Epstein, most pediatric Interventions are marked by small changes in relative weight or adiposity and substantial relapse. So we have to ask, why is this paradigm, which sounds so simple, right? Just eat less, move more. It sounds really simple. In fact, its simplicity has arguably led to some of the stigmatization and discrimination that people with this particular med medical problem endure, right? If it is so simple, you know, it's just a matter of willpower and discipline. Anybody who doesn't manage to maintain a healthy weight must be undisciplined, must be have a you know, poor willpower or not really respect themselves or have a character issue. And so, you know, we've seen time and time again how people with this medical problem are discriminated against, subject to teasing, abuse. Um, jokes on late night TV in ways that would never be acceptable for other medical problems. In, in children, sometimes with tragic consequences, this kind of um, uh, teasing. So this paradigm has, I think, led to stigmatization and also failure, you know? And we have to ask why. Why has such a simple approach, just eat less, move more, just maybe a slice or two of bread less, a little more physical activity, just stick to it and you'll lose weight. Why has that not worked? Well, the most obvious explanation is that it disregards a century of research into the biological determinants of body weight. We, we know very well that there are complex, uh, integrated and overlapping circuitry relating the brain to fat cells, the liver, muscle, pancreas, the rest of the digestive tract, through neurological inf influences and hormones, which serve to control body weight, way beyond our conscious mind's ability to manipulate. So when an individual at a whatever their usual weight is, be that a normal weight for someone who happens to be habitually thin or some, at a high body weight for someone who's who has been struggling with weight, when that person is weight reduced, characteristic biological changes occur. Well, of course, hunger increases, but energy expenditures, metabolic rate slows down. And those two adaptations, physiological adaptations, are going to push body weight back to where it started over time. But the opposite is also true when individuals or experimental animals are force-fed in, in studies, controlled studies, yes, they'll gain weight for a while, but their hunger diminishes and their energy expenditure increases in the body's attempt to burn off those extra calories. Again, leading weight back down to baseline, giving rise to this notion of a body weight set point, that we have a certain weight or a range where you know, our body is most comfortable. And anything that we do, you know, if we try to change from there, it's going to be a constant battle with biology that we're doomed to lose. So, of course, we do know that there are a lot of genetic factors and other biological influences that affect this, but we're left with two critical questions. First, if there is this body weight set point, this weight that we defend through biological responses, why does it seem to keep creeping up year after year you know, in the last 40 years as the obesity epidemic has unfolded? Why are we now, why would the person with the same genetic factors and you know, other 
similar uh, demographics and the like. Why would that person happily defend a weight of 150 pounds in 1960, and now their body isn't happy unless they're 185? And most importantly, what can we do about it? Well, we know that this basic equation of calorie intake, calorie expenditure, and body fat storage, that can't be wrong. That's a basic law of thermodynamics. But perhaps our assumptions about the direction of causality, the way that the arrows are pointed, maybe that's the problem. So maybe the arrows aren't actually going from left to right. They're actually going from right to right, right to left. So in an alternative, but just as um, acceptable from a physics standpoint, an, internal, an alternative perspective, something has triggered our fat cells to take in and store too many calories. So they have become anabolic. And so they suck up too many, too much glucose and fatty acids, these calorie-rich substances in our blood. And so instead of having too many calories forced into fat cells, we actually have too few calories in the blood. The brain sees that and does what it's supposed to do. It makes us hungry. It thinks that we are starving. And that's why we overeat. And if we try to ignore that, uh, that decline in metabolic fuels will trigger a slowdown in metabolism. And so we get tired and we're more likely to collapse on the couch. So those, so it becomes increasingly difficult to just eat less and to move more over time. And the body fights back even further with other metabolic changes, lowering resting energy expenditure. So just the number of calories we burn off when we're sitting or when we're asleep can alter and muscular efficiency and so forth. So from this perspective, the advice to eat less and move more is at best symptomatic treatment destined to fail in a, an environment in which people are surrounded by food and not forced to be working 12 hours a day on a farm. So what could be triggering our fat cells to become excessively anabolic? Well, the most obvious candidate is insulin. Uh, insulin is the granddaddy of all anabolic hormones. We know that uh, insulin regulates the uh, availability of all of the metabolic fuels. So it stimulates the fat cells to um, synthesize fat and to take in fat from the bloodstream and, and glucose, and it inhibits the release of calories from their storage sites in fat and in liver. Uh, we know that excessive insulin action predictably causes weight gain. So if you, if, uh, whereas the opposite is also true, not enough insulin action predictably causes weight loss. If a child with type 1 diabetes, when that child first comes to attention, this is an autoimmune condition in which the pancreas can't make enough insulin, that child will have invariably lost weight if the diabetes has gone on for a while. No matter how much he's eaten, 5,000, 10,000 calories a day, weight loss is a consistent finding in new onset type 1 diabetes. You give that child just enough insulin and weight returns to its previous trajectory, give that child or an adult with type 2 diabetes too much insulin, and excessive weight gain predictably occurs. In animals, this has been well shown. You know, animals given insulin become their blood sugar drops, they become hungry, they gain weight. And even if you prevent them from gaining weight by cutting back their food, they still become fatter. So that insulin, again, is still exerting a metabolic effect, and we're going to see a dramatic example of this soon, uh, even when you control calories. So if insulin, too, making too much insulin is triggering our fat cells to go on calorie storage overdrive, what's leading to uh, this excessive production of insulin? Again, here again, the obvious candidate is, uh, is well known. It's endocrinology 101. Uh, it's too much and the wrong kinds of carbohydrate. Both the total amount of carbohydrate that we're eating, which is much increased as you decrease fat in the diet, protein stays, typically stays in a pretty normal range. So with decreasing 
Fat, we increase total carbohydrate. And in addition, the processing of that carbohydrate has become much more extreme, um, increasing what's called the glycemic index. The glycemic index measures how blood sugar changes in response to the, a controlled amount of carbohydrate. So after consuming white bread, white rice, prepared breakfast cereals, those low-fat cookies, snacks, many of which were sold as health foods, these starches or sugars re digest into sugar in the digestive tract very quickly. Starches are just made up of sugar in a long chain, glucose in a long chain. So that leads to a very rapid rise in blood sugar, whereas other carbohydrates that are less processed, even sugar-containing uh, carbohydrates, like whole fruit, most of the calories from whole fruit is simply sugar. But in an intact, in its intact form, whole fruit digests more slowly, so that the sugars drip at, are, are slowly pulled out of the uh, uh, food matrix of the fruit, the cellular matrix, slowly pulled out. They don't hit the bloodstream very quickly. So these other pro unprocessed carbohydrates, calorie for calorie, gram of carbohydrate for gram of carbohydrate, have a much more gentle effect on blood sugar. So, um, and then the term glycemic load takes into account both. So the amount of carbohydrate and the glycemic index. So a carrot, for example, or even a slice of watermelon has a high glycemic index, but you don't have a lot of carbohydrate in those foods. Compare that to a typical serving from a baked potato um, or a bagel. Now that has a high glycemic index and a lot of carbohydrate, so that's going to cause a very big impact on blood sugar. So what happens acutely? Well, we looked at this uh, first. I first looked at this in a study with uh, 12 uh, adolescents who had high BMI given one of three meals on three different occasions, a vegetable omelet with fruit, no processed carbohydrate, or instant oatmeal with milk and a little milk and sugar. Instant oatmeal is designed to be instantly um, edible. So it also digests very quickly and raises blood sugar rapidly, even though this is a whole grain product. This was, we had this made from whole grains. So again, whole grains can be misleading if it's highly processed. Versus steel cut oats, that's an old fashioned way that uh, oats have been made. Few people have time for that anymore. It uh, cooks in 30 minutes. It also digests more slowly. So these two had the same protein, fat, and carbohydrate. Literally, the, essentially the same foods. So what happened? Um, as expected, insulin, with the ra rapid increase in blood sugar, insulin rose significantly more after the instant oatmeal than after the other two meals. Um, all meals had the same number of calories. When that happened, the other key hormone we don't think much about, but it plays a critically important role, glucagon, was actually suppressed after the high glycemic index, the instant oatmeal breakfast. Glucagon is like the uh, yang to insulin's yin. It does the opposite of insulin. Insulin is anabolic and promotes calorie storage. Glucagon is catabolic and helps pull calories out of storage. So if we have too much anabolic and too little catabolic, that's a double whammy. So after you eat, those calories, once they slam into the bloodstream are quickly going to be packed away in the liver and in the fat cells, other storage sites. And what's going to happen is the calories in the blood, in this case glucose, and fatty acids start to drop. And within a few hours, they're lower in the later postprandial phase after the high glycemic index meal. So glucose was 10 milligrams per deciliter different. This was a statistically significant comparison. Free fatty acids were suppressed. And the brain sees this as a true metabolic crisis. This is adrenaline or epinephrine. Remained quite flat for five hours after eating those less processed or lower glycemic load meals. Surged 
at four and five hours after the high glycemic index meal. So again, indicating that the brain is seeing this drop off of calories in the blood as a problem. And what's it going to do? It's going to make you hungry because that's the fastest way to solve the problem. Eating will restore calories in the blood quickly. And when we gave subjects free access to food, they consumed six or 700 calories more after the high glycemic index meal. So if, that, if a fraction of that difference were maintained meal after meal, day after day, it could explain a lot of the obesity epidemic just by itself. What's happening actually in the brain after eating a high glycemic index meal? To look at that, we uh, examined 12 uh, young men, again, high body mass index, in a double blind fashion. So neither they nor the experimenter who was interacting with them knew what these uh, uh, participants were getting. On one day, and, and so we gave them uh, milkshakes on two different days. On one day, the milkshake was made from uh, uncooked cornstarch, which is a very slow digesting starch, uh, minimally processed, and it, it just happens to take the body a while to turn into sugar. Um, it's uncooked cornstarch. It's not the kind of corn starch you see added to food. So, you know, this was just an experimental condition. So, um, the other had corn syrup, which is very processed and will, will raise blood sugar within minutes after consumption. I want to point out that neither of these milkshakes had any fructose. So what you're about to see is the effects uh, just of the rate of digestion of glucose and how fast blood sugar rises. And uh, again, what we saw was that there was this expected increase of blood sugar and this fall off a few hours later um, following the fast-acting milkshake. And then hunger increased faster after the fast-acting milkshake. And then we did a brain imaging with something called um, uh, uh, arterial spin labeling functional MRI which can look directly at what areas of the brain are becoming active. And we saw one area that uh, lit up like a laser because it happened after every single participant following the high glycemic index compared to the low glycemic index milkshake. So it was highly consistent. We had very strong p-values. This area is called the nucleus accumbens. That's considered ground zero for the classic addictions of cocaine, heroin, alcoholism. It's the center of the dopamine striergic reward and pleasure center. Raising a provocative idea that these fast digesting, highly processed food, industrial food products that have flooded our diet in the last 30, 40 years are hijacking basic pleasure and reward systems, leading to something that might look akin to a food addiction. So these are short-term human studies. What, what, ha can, what, what happens over a longer period of time when you control all of the factors? Well, that's very difficult to do in humans, but uh, you can look at this in animal models. In this case, we, um, we used rats that were uh, at risk for type 2 diabetes. We gave them identical diets, same protein, fat, and carbohydrate, but again, in one case, fast-acting carbohydrate, um, a starch called amylopectin. It's a big fluffy mo molecule that digests quickly. And in the other case, uh, amylose, which is a smaller, tighter molecule that takes longer to digest. And we further control the intake of both groups to prevent any differences in body weight. And then we measured what happened to their body composition, the relative amounts of fat and lean tissue. You can see that over the course of these 18 weeks, the two groups, low and high glycemic index, maintained virtually superimposable average weights. But to keep the weights the same in the high glycemic index group, we had to begin restricting their food intake. That high glycemic index group in yellow was showing a tendency to gain weight excessively on the same number of calories, which means what? Their metabolism was slowing down. 
So we had to cut back. We did what you're supposed to do. If you're gaining weight, you cut back calories. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, we reduced their calorie intake. So by the end of the study, these animals ate less to prevent excessive weight. But look what happened. At that same weight, these high glycemic index uh, fed animals had 70% more fat. And so they had a reduction in their lean body tissue. Now, I'm glad that this isn't a, uh, a lecture that uh, people are eating their lunch because this is going to, the next slide will be my one graphic slide. These two animals weigh the same and they're representative of their groups. Same weight. Low glycemic index animal had very little belly fat. The high glycemic index animal's belly was loaded with this highest risk uh, fat depot. This finding defies the conventional calorie in, calorie out model. Because again, remember, this animal was gaining weight excessively, not for genetic reasons, but because of presumably the high insulin that occurred on that diet. And then we did what you're supposed to do. You put the, you put the poor little animal on a diet. And um, of course, he probably felt very hungry. But even despite the successful control of body weight, which is very hard to do in humans, it still was loaded with fat and had sky high diabetes and heart disease risk factors. All right, um, I'll tell you about one more uh, feeding study uh, to see, we, we conducted to see if some of these principles actually apply in humans over more than just one day. So we uh, looked at 21 young adults who had high body weight. We brought their weight down by 10 or 15% by restricting calories. We know that calorie restriction works over the short term. Nobody's denying that. Um, it's just what happens over the long term when the body fights back. So we brought their weights down and then we put them at this reduced body weight for a month at a time on one of three diets, either a low fat, conventional low fat diet, 60% carbohydrate, 20% fat, just as we've been advised to eat um, for years, or at the other extreme, an Atkins type, very high fat diet with a whopping 60% fat, which was previously thought would be a recipe for you know, massive obesity, all that fat. And then in the middle, uh, for Stavros's benefit, uh, we had a Mediterranean diet, 40% um, carbohydrate, 40% fat. And we measured energy expenditure in the resting state and by indirect calorimetry, and we also used uh, doubly labeled water, stable isotopes for total energy expenditure. And um, here's what we found. I'll just skip, to, yeah, I'll just skip to the total energy expenditure. So with weight loss, this is the total calories burned before weight loss. So it averaged a little over 3,200 calories a day. These were you know, heavy people, so that's perfectly uh, consistent with expectation. With weight loss on the low-fat diet, calorie expenditure declined by more than 400 a day, and that's more than can be explained by the weight loss. At the same degree of weight loss, on the low-carb diet, there was actually no statistically significant decline in calorie expenditure at all. This difference of 325 calories is again, if it were persistent, enough to explain most of the obesity epidemic, even without postulating a change in energy intake. So the same calories going in, so the, the, the type of calories going in at the same rate, but just the type of calories going in affect the number of calories being burned off, and that effect can either promote or undermine a long-term weight management diet. Okay, so I want to um, move toward uh, uh, finishing up by considering for a moment the long-term behavioral studies. Of course, that's what we need. We need really long-term studies to see which diets work best, uh, ultimately in a real-life situation. And these long-term studies characteristically come to the same conclusion. Diet doesn't matter. You can lose weight on any diet as long as you follow it. 
that's the outcomes. And the uh, perhaps most famous of these is the pounds lost study. 800 individuals studied for two years, assigned to diets that varied quite considerably by design in carbohydrate from 35 to 65%, fat 20 to 40, protein 15 to 20. Now this is not as big as the differences that we looked at in our feeding study, but you know, in that uh, energy expenditure study I just showed you, but these are quite substantial differences. If these were maintained and we didn't see any difference in clinical outcomes, it would really raise an important question about you know, diet composition. Uh, and so this study, like many others, found no differences in body weight according to group. High carbohydrate, low protein fat. And that's given rise to this, again, this notion that it's all about compliance. All diets, you can lose weight and all that. I think that's an incorrect conclusion because there are significant design limitations to the study. And virtually all of the other long-term behavioral studies. And that limitation is that the individuals characteristically did not achieve these targeted dietary goals. I, I showed you how big of a difference they had intended. The maximum reported differences, you know, at the peak of compliance was 9% in fat and 5% in protein. So less than half of what was intended. And even these small differences were probably overstated due to what's known as a social desirability bias. So if I uh, recruit you to a, a study and I select you for you know, your willingness to participate, um, I tell you to follow a low-fat diet, and then I give you financial compensation for participating, and then I ask you, what are you eating? What are you going to say? you'll probably say a low-fat diet regardless of what the truth is. And when you look at biomarkers, which don't lie, and which aren't subject to social desirability bias, there is very little difference between groups. Triglycerides are a sensitive marker of dietary carbohydrate, no difference. Nitrogen excretion, a sensitive marker of protein, no significant difference. And RQ, which is a measure of uh, fat and, and carbohydrate, had a very small difference, suggesting that mostly all of the groups were eating much the same, demonstrating the difficulty of long-term behavioral change in our modern food environment. So you know, that, is, uh, you know, that is a notable finding. But what you can't determine from this is whether one diet actually works better if you follow it. You know, it's like if we had a, an exciting new treatment for cancer, a new drug, but you had to take it at a very special time frame and, you know, and you couldn't take other drugs around it, you had to follow a particular protocol. So you had this exciting drug, um, you told participants in the study to take it, but nobody took it right. They didn't get the right instructions or the right support, or they couldn't find a pharmacy with it. And so they didn't take the drug properly, and then they didn't show any benefit in terms of cancer remission. What would you conclude from that study? Well, we need a better study, you'd conclude. You wouldn't conclude that that drug is ineffective and then disregard it, and yet that's what we routinely do with nutrition studies. We need much better designs, and there are a few studies that do have more rigorous designs in which individuals are actually supported to consume the prescribed diets. This is a called the direct study it was done in Israel at a nuclear power facility where individuals checked in in the morning and they ate many of their meals throughout the day and Israel is part of the Mediterranean the main meal was eaten at midday and so they could actually produce those meals in the cafeteria and you'd get your assigned diet now, this didn't change 100% of what they were eating, um, but it changed a substantial amount of it, much more than in the traditional behavioral studies. And here again, they looked at low-fat, low-carb, or Mediterranean. And they had excellent completion rates, 90%. And here's the outcome. The, now we're seeing significant um, 
uh, statistically and clinically significant differences among the diets. The low fat, the low carb diet showed a rapid weight loss, some weight regain, but stabilization out through two years. The Mediterranean moderate fat diet group lost weight a little more slowly, but caught up to the low carb group. So maybe the Mediterranean uh, diet is more of the tortoise to the low carb hare. And the low fat diet clearly did the worst uh, compared to the other two. And uh, let's see how we're doing the timing. Yeah, I'll just tell you this one last study. Um, another study which had a partial feeding component. You would go to a, like a, 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 a special shop where all of the foods on the diet to which you were assigned had a barcode. And so based on uh, which group you were in, you were allowed to check out certain foods and you know uh, purchase them in effect for free, other foods you weren't allowed to have. So that helped produce differentiation between the groups. In this study um, called Diogenes, with participants from eight countries in Europe, so a pretty generalized study, uh, here looked at again big numbers, 700 people, almost 800 people, who initially lost 8% of their weight and then were randomly assigned to either uh, a low glycemic index or high glycemic index diet or a low protein or a high protein diet in all combinations. And what they were looking at over the next six months was weight regain from this significant weight loss. So in the group that had the high protein, low glycemic index, that would have the lowest glycemic load because some of that protein is replacing the carbohydrate. And the remaining carbohydrate was more slowly digested. That group showed perfect weight loss maintenance. That's rare to see over a, in a dietary study. The high glycemic load group, low protein, high GI, had the most rapid weight regain, and the two intermediate groups showed intermediate values. This is as close to a dose response curve as you'll get in nutrition research. Okay, so I've argued that uh, all of the processed carbohydrates that have flooded our diet during the low fat years has increased insulin secretion, programmed fat cells to hoard too many calories, leaving too few, not too many, in the bloodstream. That's triggered hunger and altered our metabolism in an adverse way, leading to weight regain, a weight gain. But car carbohydrate isn't the whole story. There are many other factors on fat cells that influence fat cell activity, including the types of fats we're eating, types of proteins and amount, prebiotics, probiotics, phytochemicals, all of these can influence fat cells directly or indirectly. And beyond diet, we know that um, sleep, stress, and physical activity can also have effects on metabolism and fat cell activity. This is uh, an example of how this particular dietary pattern uh, a fat cell friendly dietary pattern might look, low glycemic load pyramid, you see no reason to put grains, especially processed grains at the base. Um, we have fruits, vegetables, and legumes, no reason to decrease fat intake at all. You know, fat is a highly satiating uh, nutrient. Um, we didn't have time to go into it in much detail, but uh, some recent major clinical trials, such as Predament, show that uh, higher fat diets with nuts or olive oil um, are not only good for your waist, they're great for your heart. The Predament was stopped early because cardiovascular disease dr rates dropped so fast in the high fat groups, there was no need to continue the study to its intended termination point. Um, I don't think that we need to be eliminating grains entirely. Uh, we have too many people on the earth for us to, uh, for all of us to be eating a paleolithic diet. Uh, so we need grains to feed the population, but the key is to eat them in a balance, an appropriate balance and minimally processed as our great grandparents would have. So steel cut oats rather than instant oatmeal, 
that's called Irish oats. Um, wheat berries, as Stavros, his uh, grandmother would have, mother would have served him, rather than highly processed bread, although there was probably some of that too. Um, barley, rye, quinoa, teff. There's a range of wonderful whole kernel you know, minimal or minimally processed grains that are nutritious, have, have more micronutrients and phytochemicals. They're also delicious. They're much more interesting in taste than the white bread that we've grown accustomed to. Um, nuts and nut butters, prote uh, protein. And then I put refined grains together with sugar. I really don't distinguish them or potato products. Not that we have to abandon them completely, but we want to think of those as to be consumed sparingly. Um, so in summary and conclusion, the conventional approach to weight loss, the low calorie, low fat diet has not worked well in our modern environment. An alternative approach aims to reduce the drive of fat cells to store calories. To think about this as more of a metabolic problem rather than just as a question of willpower. And this can be achieved by lowering the total amount of carbohydrate we eat, the processing of the carbohydrate or both. Other aspects of our diet can also play a role. The behavioral randomized controlled trials have to be interpreted cautiously for reasons we discussed. That They have poor differentiation between the diets, so we really can't conclude what these studies would uh, imply we should. Um, research is needed to compare these different strategies of calorie restriction versus improvement of calorie of quality of foods without calorie restriction. We also need to be looking at moderate versus very low carbohydrate diets versus something called ketogenic diets, where there is so little carbohydrate that uh, we, the, the body begins to produce ketones in amounts sufficient to fuel much of the brain's metabolism. There's some very interesting work for decades on the ketogenic diet and epilepsy in children. In some cases, it's really a miraculous cure for otherwise intractable disease. Uh, there's preliminary research on a ketogenic diet in type 2 diabetes, and uh, I think we need to do a lot more research there. Uh, but uh, that is a, quite an extreme restriction, and uh, for most people, uh, maybe just a, sort of a moderate amount of carbohydrate uh, with focus on reducing the processing of those carbohydrates and getting high quality fats will be fully sufficient to uh, address metabolic diseases like insulin resistance, chronic inflammation. So lastly, I want to say that these ideas I presented today may be provocative, but they're not new. The editors of a leading medical journal wrote the following. When we read that the fat woman has the remedy in her own hands, or rather between her own teeth, there's the implication that obesity is merely the result of unsatisfactory dietary bookkeeping. Although logic suggests that body fat may be decreased by altering the balance sheet through diminished intake or increased output or, or both, the problem is not really so simple and uncomplicated as it is pictured. These words were written by the editors of uh, JAMA in 1924. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. And I, I'm going to have to leave after word, but I understand that there's some signed books up there if you want them. And I, we have, uh, I guess, uh, 10 minutes for, yes. for questions. Or for, if you're going to throw any fruit, make sure it's low glycemic index, please. <laughs> um, woman in the front. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that um, insulin is affected by carbohydrate intake and um, Different kinds of fats, and you pointed out a number of different things, free probiotics and variety of things. But at no point was it discussed the chemicals that we have been adding to our conventional food for decades during all of that time when weight began to go up, and the fact that those are, in fact, endocrine disruptors. So, what kind of studies are there 
on the fact that those chemicals in our food might yeah. affect no matter what. Well, I think if uh, for a full, I mean, there's uh, limits to what one can get to in uh, 15 minutes. So you have to bring me back for another lecture on that. But um, uh, I, I think I would say that it, it's implicitly considered in a whole foods approach such as this, because the whole foods that we eat are to the degree that they don't go through factories and they don't uh, have as many additives that are intentionally or unintentionally um, uh, brought along you know, will move us in the right direction. But then there's still the pesticides that are put onto even whole foods. There are chemicals in the water. Um, you know, you've heard about Flint, Michigan lately. Uh, that's lead, but uh, there are a variety of chem chemicals in the water. Um, chemicals added to food packaging you know, that leach out. BPA has gotten a lot of attention, but uh, there are other BP-like chemicals. And uh, and then chemicals in um, cosmetics. I just saw something, uh, an abstract on uh, sun sunblockers. Or I guess it was present might have been presented at the Endocrine Society that people are commonly using are causing sperm cells, sperms, uh, spermatocytes to like uh, lose their motility and not be able to swim to the uh, egg. So we'll have to see about that. But yes. Many of these substances are what's called endocrine disruptors, and endocrine disrupt disruptors uh, are very plausibly active in fat cells and could be driving them to store calories. So I think that uh, I would, you know, I think that we have to be prudent, and I, I don't want to advocate high levels of concern for everything we put in our mouth. I mean, the body has detoxification systems and um, you know, can handle moderate amounts of these kinds of insults. But we do need to be doing more research about the actual impacts of this. Uh, hard to do because the epidemiology is pretty confounded. And make sensible decisions, you know. So I'd rather people move off of highly processed industrial foods to whole foods, even strawberries, that might not be organic and might still have some pesticides, but at least they're whole foods. And then we can be thinking about how to convert the whole food supply to more natural, sustainable methods. So it seems fairly obvious that uh, an approach like this low, uh, low glycemic index, low carb approach would have cardiovascular benefits uh, over the long haul. I guess the question I would pose is, is there any direct evidence of that kind of benefit aside from inference because of lower triglycerides and things like that? Well, uh, there is. Um, so first of all, there's many lines of evidence. One is that the foods that top the list for diabetes and heart disease, even controlling for body weight in the big cohort studies, you know, and all epidemiology is not alike, but the best cohort studies like the nurses' health and health professional can begin to really drill down toward causality. And especially when it's very consistent when looked at in different ways, the ones that top the list aren't just sugar, potato products top, really are right up there, and grain, processed grains. Whereas the uh, highest calorie imaginable foods, the highest calorie foods that we have, olive oil, um, nuts, dark chocolate, dark chocolate, by the way, is mostly saturated fat, and that's the main source of calories. And yet these foods look great for weight and beyond weight, uh, diabetes and heart disease prevention. Then we had the Predimid, and we had these two studies called Look Ahead, done in the States, and Predimed, done in Spain. Look Ahead was a low-fat diet. Again, one of these studies that the low-fat group got all the advantages um, of intensity, of attention. Among people with type 2 diabetes, to prevent heart disease, for whom they are at high risk. Now, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine 2013, uh, early. They had to close down the study for futility because an initial assessment by independent statisticians found that the low-fat group, despite all the attention they got, and despite weight loss, they did get some more weight loss. You know, weight loss you get short-term um, if you cut back calories and you work really hard. Despite all that, there was no reduction in cardiovascular disease risk, nor the prospect of ever seeing a cardiovascular benefit, no matter how long they continued the study. Compare that to Predimed, which was a high-fat diet, 
two higher fat groups. One group got nuts. A second group got olive oil, a liter of olive oil a week per person delivered to the home. That's a lot of fat calories. That study published in the same journal, New England Journal of Medicine, the same year, also closed early, but not for futility, for unexpectedly high efficacy when the rates of cardiovascular disease drop faster. So I think that, uh, you know, the diet heart hypothesis, at least with regard to total fat, has been fully uh, refuted. Now, saturated fat is an issue, um, different kinds of fats, but there's different kinds of saturated fats, dairy versus meat. But as I mentioned, some whole fat, whole, whole foods that are high in saturated fat look pretty good. Full fat dairy is beginning to look much, much better than fat free dairy based on recent analyses. And, and again, um, chocolate it looks good if it's dark. I could have been right out of one of your studies here. Uh, the diabetic, the type 1 diabetic. I've been following the low carb ketogenic Atkins diet for about two years and I dropped 70 pounds. Why do the doctors still recommend insulin knowing what they know now about how it is that storage? And what happens when you stall out on something like that? What do you do next? Well, first of all, congratulations on your accomplishments. And um, you know, that's, that's really great. And uh, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not. First of all, I want to clarify, I'm not recommending that anybody with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, stop taking their insulin. High blood sugar is, you know, both uh, an acute and chronic toxin and threat. And we do need to control blood sugar, and sometimes insulin, you know, is part of that process, although it's not the, it's, it's not the best long-term strategy. You, you know, we have to use it to the degree that we manage blood sugar, and prevent these well-known complications of uncontrolled hyperglycemia. But it doesn't solve the problem, and it actually can add fuel to the fire through weight gain. So we want to, the basic problem in type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance in most cases. And so a, a success, the best treatments will address the insulin resistance um, and chronic inflammation that go along with it. One way of doing that is by eliminating carbohydrates. Another way may be just to lower the processing of that carbohydrate. And again, that may be sufficient for many people. Um, and when you do, especially if you do it carefully and under a doctor's observation, you'll watch your blood sugar start declining, and then you can tighter back insulin um, to prevent yourself from getting actually low blood sugar. As you lower insulin, you get into a victorious cycle because the less insulin you need, the easier the weight loss and the more you lose, the better your insulin resistance will be. Now, for some people who've had diabetes for many years, they're always going to need some insulin. But if you can get by on 0.5 units a day per kilo instead of two units a day per kilo, you're going to be in much, much better metabolic shape for the long term. Why doctors, uh, you know, many doctors don't recommend why there's many people are still recommending high carb diets for diabetes. Well, you know, doctors are like the public. We've been told for 40 years that if you don't want fat on your body, don't put fat into your body. And that's a hard mindset to shift. But I think that that was one of the main reasons I wrote this book. Airways promoting uh, my bands. And so uh, that, I, I wonder if, uh, if, if your work supports a, a physiologic basis for that or a more than psychiatric basis. So promoting a gastric bypass? Is that what you're saying? No, if, if your work yeah, well, yeah. explains binging. Binge eating. Yes. Uh, did I miss it here? You, did you say something about gastric bypass? No. Okay. Yeah, I think that, uh, I, uh, you know, there are, I want to go on record as saying there's clearly some major psychiatric issues around eating disorders. I'm not saying that all eating disorders are a result of uh, the foods we're eating, but I think uh, the foods we're eating 
are importantly contributing. Um, and I'll give, I give the example in the book of Addison's disease. So imagine, so Addison's is a condition, it's rare, but it tends to happen in adolescents, in which the adrenal glands um, get destroyed by an autoimmune attack. And so you lose the ability to make some hormones, and it's life-threatening unless you treat it. And if you treat it, it's, you can have a perfectly normal life. Kennedy, JFK, reportedly had Addison's disease. Um, and, but one of the hormones you lose the ability to make is aldosterone. Aldosterone helps the body hold on to salt. So in Addison's disease, the body becomes dangerously deficient in sodium in the blood. One of the first symptoms of it is salt cravings. Brain, in its wisdom, perceives the low salt and makes you develop specific salt hunger. Now imagine a teenager, a uh, teenage boy, was developing Addison's unrecognized by his parents or the doctors. So the parents will see that the, might notice that the teenager is suddenly eating a massive amount of processed foods with salt, you know, these salty chips and the like, and putting on huge amounts of salt, and they're wondering, like, what's going on here? This is bizarre behavior, and they tell the kid, don't do it. Now, the kid will, might try to pay attention to what the parent is saying, but is being driven to consume salt, and that's actually going to be saving that kid's life. And so might not eat the salty foods around the parents, but might start hoarding the chips, eating them secretly in the room, um, taking every opportunity. The parents find these uh, chip wrappers, the cookie wrappers with salty crackers and such, in the room. And they say, the son is now developing an eating disorder. I'm going to take him to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist then explores the emotional and, 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 and early life influences that might have driven this child to want these salty foods. Um, of course, all of this misses the point. It's a biological problem. To the degree that the highly processed carbohydrates we're eating are driving calories into fat cells and out of the bloodstream, and the brain is seeing a problem, we are going to have a battle between mind and metabolism that will lay the groundwork for binge eating. You can resist it, but at a certain point, boom, you know, you're going to binge. You know, and that's, a, again, biologically determined. But if you treat the source of Addison's or the source of weight gain, so those fat cells calm down and more calories stay around in the bloodstream, I, I believe that many, not all, but many manifestations of eating disorders will spontaneously resolve. And um, I'll just finish with a very simple thought experiment. Consider binging on one of two foods. Well, let me just say that Bread and butter are considered both pretty tasty, but I think if you asked people just right off the bat which was tastier, white bread or butter, people might would probably typically say butter. It's really tasty. Now imagine binging on one of them. You could eat a, a loaf of bread, or let's say a half a loaf of bread, or a half a stick of butter. Same calories. But think about it. If the, It'd be no, not too much trouble to eat like a 500-calorie bagel. People do it all the time. But what, what would happen if you tried to eat a half a stick of butter? Maybe that first bite might be, well, this is interesting. And then the second, third, you're, you know, you're starting to get a little sick to your stomach. You, if you finish that half a stick, are you going to be interested in having another half a stick of butter anytime soon? <laughs> Probably not, because those calories are staying around your digestive tract, entering your bloodstream, and they don't have anywhere to go. And they're going to be producing satiety, and if you keep eating, nausea. Whereas the bagel raised your insulin, you might feel happy for, you feel good for an hour. That's why you binge on bagels, because they rapidly raise your blood sugar. But three hours later, those calories are going to be gone. You'll be right back where you started and you'll be wanting the next page. So I think on that provocative note, maybe I will thank you again for your attention and uh, look forward to continuing the dialogue.